<laughs> Hello. Hi. Welcome everyone. Hi. Welcome along. Welcome to another Ghost Stories live stream with me, Luke. Hey, that's my name. Uh, hello everyone in the chat, welcome along. Hello Luke, says Andrew B. Borgerom says, hello Luke. Good evening Luke, says Fancy Space Owl. Great to see you all, as per. Uh, today, uh, on Ghost Stories, we are going to be reading, a th uh, we are going to be reading The Residence at, at Whitminster by M.R. James. I said that after last time's, uh, debacle with the, uh, pantaloons, we don't need to go into it. Uh, we would do some M.R. James, something real classic creepiness you can't be mr james but just straight down the line good old-fashioned gothic horror and this one is a good one it's quite long it's a longer story than we've been reading generally it's still very much a short story but uh yeah i want to crack on because it is a uh, it's something more like an epic claire t rex says the important question is does luke absolutely promise there's no haunted trousers in this one um well, gosh, it would be a spoiler to say that I absolutely promise, wouldn't it? Hmm. Gentle Mandrill, thank you so much for the super chat. Says, some good old MR James, nothing beats that. Important question. Did everyone's pantaloons remain unstolen since last time? I still have all of mine. <gasps> and Sarah says, Luke, you're missing the fancy chair. Oh my goodness, I am missing the fancy chair. Wait, hang on, I can fix this. Bear with me. Bear with me. I've, the, the spirits call me away. Ah, spirits, no. Why, why spirits? What's that, spirit? You wish to give me this gift from beyond the realm of the known? From the... to the paranormal, this gift? Wow. Of this ornate scarf? My goodness. Thank you, spirits. They're all right, though, spirits. Oh, what's that, spirits? You wish to break my green screen slightly? Oh, fickle and capricious spirits. Thank you for repairing it and fixing it. Okay. Well, look. There we are, folks. We're back. The demons have bought me my fancy chair and didn't steal my trousers. Um, although, I mean, if they did, I would... Uh, if they did, I would... Um, I, would I would not say. I'd keep it to myself. Uh, right, so... Where were we? Yes, right. Uh, if this is the first one of these you're joining, the way we do it is we read this old ghost story. We take breaks to chat, see how, see how it's going, see what we're thinking of the story. Uh, I've got my drink in the fancy goblet with me. Oh, a bit of invisible creepy ghost fingers there. Very haunting. Uh, let me know what you are eating and drinking at home, wherever you're watching from. And let me know also if this is the first stream that you are catching. Um, because I would like to say hello. Matt C says, my first live gothic story. Matt C, welcome along. Welcome to the fold. I think you'll find it quite horrifying. You've joined a very horrifying club. Ah, oh, brilliant. And Challenger Quill says, finally caught the live stream live. Amazing. Uh, well, ah, uh, look, Ath Athanasius says, um, here comes the disclaimer. And that's right. Folks know what's coming. Dan in the chat says, warning, Victorians ahead. That's right. We read these stories because it is great fun to examine the origins of the horror genre. The very earliest horror fiction. Um, but along the way, we may encounter the real horror, which are Victorian attitudes to, well, all sorts, really. Nationality, colonialism, mental health, women, gender, race. Take your pick. Um... But there we go. There is the disclaimer. These are old, old stories. But this one, The Residence at Whitminster, like all of M.R. James' ones, uh, is, I mean, pretty focused on antiquarian stuff, academic stuff. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I think you're going to... Yeah, Katie Douglas says, disclaimer, gestures at everything. Everything. Disclaimer, Victorians be bad, says Danny McNamara. Yep. Hard to argue with that. Ah, Fran Fry in the chat says, fancy. Chair ghosts have been pa have been pacified. Well, have they though? We'll find out. Michaela Hawkins says, "My first live. My friend and I drove to Florida from Michigan and listened to your stories the whole way. <gasps> Amazing! That's so cool to hear. 
Thank you, Michaela Hawkins, for telling me that. That's awesome. Wow. Road trip. Road trip ghost stories. Amazing. Secret Agent Sam says, thank you for the super chat, Secret Agent Sam says, Luke, it's my birthday Saturday, so here's a gift. No, no, Secret Agent Sam, that's not the way it works. You, no, that, you've got the gift has gone the wrong way. Your streams and your music have been a bright spot in a stressful time, thank you so much. And thanks to the Spicy Sad Squad for being such kind and supportive people. Well, that's where the thanks should really be going. Yes, thank you, um, Spicy Sad Squad. You have, uh, you have kept me uh in engaged and 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 happy and chill in these weird times and secret agent sam happy happy birthday for saturday i hope you have a wonderful day i hope you have a wonderful day and that you don't get any birthday ghost visitations unless it's a kind of good birthday ghost who kind of shows up with a ghost cake which can happen i've become something of an authority on the occult the occult and i can tell you that sometimes a birthday ghost will show up and give you a cake um it's just Brianna says, finally allowed to work from home. So here's a tip to celebrate. Thanks for keeping me saying the last several months. Much love. Thank you very much. It's just Brianna. That's very generous. And uh, that's cool that you get to work from home at last. Working from home is great. I mean, I preferred working from home when it wasn't enforced. And I felt like it was more of a choice. But there's a lot to recommend it. Connie the Burb says, first live stream. It's 4 a.m. here. I'm snuggled with my cats Phoebe and Mifa. Put this towards spoopy snacks. Thank you, Connie. That's so kind. I will indeed put it towards spoopy snacks. Phoebe and Mifa. I wonder if Mifa could potentially be named after Mifa from Birth of the World. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to assume. Okay. Right. As I say, this story, you're getting your value here, folks, because it's a long old one. So settle in. This is The Residence at Whitminster by M.R. James. It is from a collection which is brilliantly called A Thin Ghost and Others. As in and other ghost stories. Folks, here we go. Dr. Ashton, Thomas Ashton, Doctor of Divinity, sat in his study, habited in a dressing gown and with a silk cap on his shaven head his wig being, for the time, taken off and placed on its block on a side table. He was a man of some fifty-five years, strongly made, of a sanguine complexion, an angry eye and a long upper lip. Face and eye were lighted up at the moment when I picture him by the level ray of an afternoon sun that shone in upon him through a tall sash window, giving on the west. The room into which it shone was also tall, lined with bookcases and, where the wall showed between them, panelled. On the table near the doctor's elbow was a green cloth, and upon it what he would have called a silver standish, a tray with inkstands, quill pens, a calf-bound book or two, some papers, a church warden pipe and brass tobacco box, a flask cased in plaited straw, and a liquor glass. The year was 1730, the month December, the hour somewhat past three in the afternoon. I have described in these lines pretty much all that a superficial observer would have noted when he looked into the room. What met Dr. Ashton's eye when he looked out of it, sitting in his leather armchair, though? Well, little more than the tops of the shrubs and fruit trees of his garden could be seen from that point, but the red brick wall of it was visible in almost all the length of its western side. In the middle of that was a gate, a double gate of rather elaborate iron scrollwork, which allowed something of a view beyond. Though it could see that the ground sloped away almost at once to a bottom, along which a stream must run and rose steeply from it on the other side, up to a field that was park-like in character and thickly studded with oaks, now, of course, leafless. They did not stand so thick together but that some glimpse of sky and horizon could be seen between their stems. The sky was now golden and the horizon, a horizon of distant woods, it seemed, was purple. But all that Dr. Ashton could find to say after contemplating this prospect for many minutes was abominable. A listener would have been aware immediately upon this of the sound of footsteps coming somewhat hurriedly in the direction of the study. By the resonance, he could have told that they were traversing a much larger room. Dr. Ashton turned round in his chair as the door opened and looked expectant. The incomer was a lady, a stout lady in the dress of the time, Though I have made some attempt at indicating the doctor's costume, I will not enterprise that of his wife, for it was Mrs. Ashton who now entered. She had an anxious, even a sorely distracted look. 
and it was in a very disturbed voice that she almost whispered to Dr. Ashton, putting her head close to his. He's in a very sad way, love. Worse, I'm afraid. Is he really? And he leaned back and looked in her face. She nodded. Two solemn bells, high up and not far away, rang out for the half hour at this moment. Mrs. Ashton started. Oh, do you think you can give orders that the minster clock be stopped chiming tonight? It's just over his chamber, it will keep him from sleeping, and, and to sleep is the only chance for him, that's certain. Why, to be sure, if there were, if there were need, real need, it, it could be done, but not upon any light occasion. Uh, this, uh, Frank, now, do you assure me that his recovery stands upon it? said Dr. Ashton. His voice was loud and rather hard. I do verily believe it, said his wife. Then, if it must be, bid Molly run across to Simpkins and say on my authority that he is to stop the clock chimes at sunset. And yes, she is after that to say to my Lord Saul that I wish to see him presently in this room. Mrs. Ashton hurried off. Before any other visitor enters, it will be well to explain the situation. Dr. Ashton was the holder, among other preferments, of a prebend in the rich collegiate church of Whitminster, one of the foundations which, though not a cathedral, survived dissolution and reformation and retained its constitution and endowments for a hundred years after the time of which I write. The great church, the residences of the dean and the two prebendaries, the choir and its appurtenances were all intact and in working order. A dean who flourished soon after 1500 had been a great builder and had erected a spacious quadrangle of red brick adjoining the church for the residence of the officials. Some of these persons were no longer required. Their offices had dwindled down to mere titles borne by clergy or lawyers in the town and neighbourhood, and so the houses that had been meant to accommodate eight or ten people were now shared among three, the dean and the two prebendaries. Dr Ashton's included what had been the common parlour and the dining hall of the whole body, it occupied a whole side of the court, and at one end had a private door into the minster. The other end, as we have seen, looked out over the country. So much for the house. As for the inmates, Dr Ashton was a wealthy man and childless, and he had adopted, or rather undertaken to bring up, the orphan son of his wife's sister. Frank Seidel was the lad's name. He had been a good many months in the house. Then, one day, came a letter from an Irish peer, the Earl of Kildonan, who had known Dr Ashton at college, putting it to the doctor whether he would consider taking into his family the Viscount Saul, the Earl's heir, and acting in some sort as his tutor. Lord Kildonan was shortly to take up a post in the Lisbon Embassy, and the boy was unfit to make the voyage. Not that he is sickly, the Earl wrote, though you'll find him whimsical, or of late I've thought him so, and to confirm this, it was only today his old nurse came expressly to tell me he was possessed. But let that pass. I'll warrant you can find a spell to make all straight. Your arm was stout enough in old days, and I give you plenary authority to use it as you see fit. The truth is, he has here no boys of his age or quality to consort with, and is given to moping around in our wraths and graveyards, and he brings home romances that fright my servants out of their wits. So there are you and your lady forewarned. It was perhaps with half an eye open to the, to the possibility of an Irish bishopric, at which another sentence in the Earl's letter seemed to hint, that Dr Ashton accepted the charge of my Lord Viscount Saul and of the 200 guineas a year that were to come with him. So he came one night in September. When he got out of the chase that bought him, he went first and spoke to the postboy and gave him some money and patted the neck of his horse. Whether he made some movement that scared it or not, there was very nearly a nasty accident, for the beast started violently, and the postillion, being unready, was thrown and lost his fee, as he found afterwards, and the chase lost some paint on the gateposts, and the wheel went over the man's foot who was taking out the baggage. When Lord Saul came up the steps into the light of the lamp in the porch to be greeted by Dr Ashton, he was to be seen to be a thin youth of, say, sixteen years old, with straight black hair and the pale colouring that is common to such a figure. He took the accident and commotion calmly enough, and expressed a proper anxiety for the people who had been or might have been hurt. His voice was smooth and pleasant, and without any trace, curiously, of an Irish brogue. Frank Seidel was a younger boy, perhaps of eleven or twelve, but Lord Saul did not, for that, reject his company. 
Frank was able to teach him various games he had not known in Ireland, and he was apt to learning them, apt to at his books, though he had little or no regular teaching at home. It was not long before he was making a shift to puzzle out the inscriptions on the tombs in the Minster, and he would often put a question to the doctor about the old books in the library that required some thought to answer. It is to be supposed that he made himself very agreeable to the servants, for within ten days of his coming they were almost falling over each other in their efforts to oblige him. At the same time, Mrs Ashton was rather put to it to find new maid servants, for there were several changes, and some of the families in the town from which she had been accustomed to draw seemed to have no one available. She was forced to go further afield than was usual. These generalities I gather from the doctor's notes in his diary and from letters. They are generalities, and we should like, in view of what has to be told, something sharper and more detailed. Well, we get it, in entries which begin late in the year, and I think were posted up altogether after the final incident. But they cover so few days in all that there is no need to doubt that the writer could remember the course of things accurately. On a Friday morning it was that a fox, or perhaps a cat, made away with Mrs Ashton's most prized black cockerel, a bird without a single white feather on its body. Her husband had told her often enough that it would make a suitable sacrifice to Aesculapius. That had discomforted her much, and now she would hardly be consoled. The boys looked everywhere for traces of it. Lord Saul brought in a few feathers, which seemed to have been partially burnt on the garden rubbish heap. It was on the same day that Dr Ashton, looking out of an upper window, saw the two boys playing in the corner of the garden, at a game he did not understand. Frank was looking earnestly at something in the palm of his hand. Saul stood behind him and seemed to be listening. After some minutes, he very gently laid his hand on Frank's head, and almost instantly thereupon Frank suddenly dropped whatever it was that he was holding, clapped his hands to his face and sank down on the grass. Saul, whose face expressed great anger, hastily picked the object up, of which it could only be seen that it was glittering, put it in his pocket and turned away, leaving Frank huddled up on the grass. Dr Ashton rapped on the window to attract their attention, and Saul looked up as if in alarm, and then springing to Frank, pulled him up by the arm and led him away. When they came in to dinner, Saul explained that they had been acting a part of the tragedy of Radamistus, in which the heroine reads the future fate of her father's kingdom by means of a glass ball held in her hand, and is overcome by the terrible events she has seen. During this explanation, Frank said nothing, only looked rather bewilderedly at Saul. He must, Mrs Ashton thought, have contracted a chill from the wet of the grass, for that evening he was certainly feverish and disordered, and the disorder was of the mind as well as the body for he seemed to have something he wished to say to Mrs Ashton. Only a press of household affairs prevented her from paying attention to him, and when she went, according to her habit, to see that the light in the boy's chamber had been taken away, and to bid them good night, he seemed to be sleeping, though his face was unnaturally flushed, to her thinking. Lord Saul, however, was pale and quiet, and smiling in his slumber. Let's take a break. Let's take a little break there. I'm going to perform a quick microphone adjustment because it's a little low down. One second. Here we go. Let's bring that up slightly. There we go. Well, so what have we got? We've got Dr. and Mrs. Ashton who live in a big old house. They've got two adopted children. Uh, wards, I guess. Frank and Saul. Frank's a bit younger. Saul is tall and pale and thin and freaks out horses. And he has been playing a game with Frank in the garden, following the mysterious disappearance of this cockerel, which vanished, only for some burned feathers to turn up. Hmm. Nimbletack says, Saul seems like a pleasant young chap and not some evil sorceress necromancer or anything at all. Whereas Elise says, oh, it's just his emo phase, pay no mind. <laughs> yep. Yep, 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 yep. 
Frodo Baggins says, better tall Saul. <laughs> That's good. And Beth Bloomer says, Luke, your chair creaks in a very atmospheric way. Thank you. Oh, yeah. There it is. So, Saul clearly up to something a little mysterious. And it has left Frank um, feverish. I just want to point out that uh, the thing that really struck me so far was that young Frank, the ward of Mr. and of Dr. and Mrs. Ashton, um, has taken very ill and is feverish and seems desperate to tell Mrs. Ashton something. Um, and he wants to he wants to communicate some kind of message, but he can't because Mrs. Ashton uh, is busy. Only a press of household affairs prevented her from paying attention to him. So, like, he's there like, this is Lady Ashton, please, a word, a message. I must... And she's like, not now. <laughs> this laundry won't sort itself. I suppose she's not probably not doing the laundry, is she? They've got a whole gang of servants. But there you go. David Badalotti says, can't watch now, but I'm looking forward to the oncoming spookening. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Spookening is looming large. Laura Ann says, a press of household affairs. I feel that in my soul. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And Dan says, I love how they're also reluctant to turn off the also reluctant to turn off the bells to help his recovery too. Well, how sick is he? Yeah, that's right. She's like, could we turn off the church bells today because they they're going to stress him out. And Doctor Ashton is like, what's he say? Why, to be sure, if there were need, real need, it could be done, but not upon any light occasion. It's like, the boy is sick. Turn off the bells. It's going to be fine. Okay, so. What will happen to young Frank? What will happen to Lord Saul, pale and quiet and smiling in his slumber? I think we'd better find out, hadn't we? Next morning, it happened that Dr. Ashton was occupied in church and other business and unable to take the boys' lessons. He therefore set them tasks to be written and brought to him. Three times, if not oftener, Frank knocked at the study door, and each time the doctor chanced to be engaged with some visitor and sent the boy off rather roughly, which he later regretted. Two clergymen were at dinner this day, and both remarked, being fathers of families, that the lad seemed sickening for a fever, in which they were too near the truth, and it had been better if he had been put to bed forthwith, for a couple of hours later, in the afternoon, he came running into the house, crying out in a way that was really terrifying, and rushed, rushing to Mrs. Ashton, clung about her, begging her to protect him, and saying, Keep them off! Keep them off! Keep them off! Without intermission. And it was now evident that some sickness had taken strong hold of him. He was therefore got to bed in another chamber from that in which he commonly lay, and the physician brought to him, who pronounced the disorder to be grave, and affecting the lad's brain, and prognosticated a fatal end to it if strict quiet were not observed, and those sedative remedies used which he should prescribe. We are now come by another way to the point we had reached before. The minster clock has been stopped from striking, and Lord Saul is on the threshold of the study. What account can you give of this poor lad's state? was Dr. Ashton's first question. Why, sir, little more than you know already, I fancy. I must blame myself, though, for giving him a fright yesterday when we were acting that foolish play you saw. I fear I made him take it more to heart than I meant. How so? Well, by telling him foolish tales I had picked up in Ireland of what we call the second sight. Second sight? What kind of sight might that be, then? Why, you know our ignorant people pretend that some are able to foresee what is to come, sometimes in a glass or in the air, maybe, and at Kildonan we had an old woman that pretended to such a power. And I dare say I coloured the matter more highly than I should, but I never dreamed Frank would take it so near as he did. You were wrong, my lord, very wrong, in meddling with such superstitious matters at all, and you should have considered whose house you were in, and how little becoming such actions are to my character and person, or to your own. But pray, how came it that you, acting, as you say, a play, should fall upon anything that could so alarm Frank? That is what I can hardly tell, sir. 
He passed all in a moment, from rant about battles and lovers and Cleodora and Antigenes, to something I could not follow at all, and then dropped down as you saw. Yes. Was that at the moment when you laid your hand on the top of his head? Lord Saul gave a quick look at his questioner, quick and spiteful, and for the first time seemed unready with an answer. About that time it must have been, he said. I've tried to recollect myself, but I'm not sure. There was, at any rate, no significance in what I did then. Uh, said Dr. Ashton. Well, my lord, I should do wrong here were I not to tell you that this fright of my poor nephew may have very ill consequences to him. The doctor speaks very despondingly of his state. Lord Saul pressed his hands together and looked earnestly upon Dr. Ashton. I'm willing to believe you had no bad intention, as assuredly you could have no reason to bear the poor boy malice, but I cannot wholly free you from blame in the affair. As he spoke, the hurrying steps were heard again and Mrs. Ashton came quickly into the room carrying a candle, for the evening had by this time closed in. She was greatly agitated. Oh, come, she cried. Come directly, I'm sure he's going. Going? Frank, is it possible? Already? With some incoherent words, the doctor caught up a book of prayers from the table and ran out after his wife. Lord Saul stopped for a moment where he was. Molly, the maid, saw him bend over and put both hands to his face. If it were the last words she had to speak, she said afterwards, he was striving to keep back a fit of laughing. Then he went out softly following the others. Mrs Ashton was sadly right in her forecast. I have no inclination to imagine the last scene in detail. What Dr Ashton records is, or may be taken to be important to the story, they asked Frank if he would like to see his companion, Lord Saul, once again. The boy was quite collected, it appears, in these moments. No, he said. I do not want to see him. But you should tell him I am afraid he will be very cold. What do you mean, my dear? said Mrs Ashton. Only that, said Frank. But say to him besides th that I am free of them now, but he should take care. And I am sorry about your black cockerel, Aunt Ashton, but, but he said we must use it so if we were to see all that could be seen. Not many minutes after, he was gone. Both the Ashtons were grieved, she naturally most, but the doctor, though not an emotional man, felt the pathos of the early death. And besides, there was the growing suspicion that all had not been told him by Saul, and that there was something here which was out of his beaten track. When he left the chamber of death, it was to walk across the quadrangle of the residence to the sexton's house. A passing bell, the greatest of the minster bells, must be rung, a grave must be dug in the minster yard, and there was now no need to silence the chiming of the minster clock. As he came slowly back in the dark, he thought he must see Lord Saul again. The matter of the black cockerel, trifling as it might seem, would have to be cleared up. It might be merely a fancy of the sick boy, but if not, was there not a witch trial he had read in which some grim little rite of sacrifice had played a part? Yes, he must see Saul. I rather guess these thoughts of his than find written authority for them. That there was another interview is certain. Certain also that Saul would, or as he said could, throw no light on Frank's words, though the message, or some part of it, appeared to affect him horribly. But there is no record of the talk in detail. It is only said that Saul sat all that evening in the study, and when he bid good night, which he did most reluctantly, asked for the doctor's prayers. The month of January was near its end, when Lord Kildonan, in the embassy at Lisbon, received a letter that for once gravely disturbed that vain man and neglectful father. Saul was dead. The scene at Frank's burial had been very distressing. The day was awful in blackness and wind, the bearers, staggering blindly along under the flapping black pall, found it a hard job, when they emerged from the porch of the minster, to make their way to the grave. Mrs Ashton was in her room. Women did not then go to their kinsfolk's funerals. But Saul was there, draped in the morning cloak of the time, and his face was white and fixed as that of one dead. Except when, as was noticed three or four times, he suddenly turned his head to the left and looked over, over his shoulder. It was then alive with a terrible expression of listening fear. 
No one saw him go away, and no one could find him that evening. All night the gale buffeted the high windows of the church and howled over the upland and roared through the woodland. It was useless to search in the open. No voice of shouting or cry for help could possibly be heard. All that Dr. Ashton could do was to warn the people about the college and the town constables and to sit up on the alert for any news, and this he did. Well, news came early next morning, brought by the sexton, whose business it was to open the church for early prayers at seven, and who sent the maid rushing upstairs with wild eyes and flying hair to summon her master. The two men dashed across the set to the south door of the minster, there to find Lord Saul, clinging desperately to the great, great ring of the door, his head sunk between his shoulders, his stockings in rags, his shoes gone, his legs torn and bloody. This is what had to be told to Lord Kildonan, and this really ends the first part of the story. The tomb of Frank Seidel and of the Lord Viscount Saul, only child and heir to William Earl of Kildonan, is one, a stone altar tomb in Whitminster Churchyard. Let's take a little break there. So, Saul didn't make it. Frank didn't make it, but I think that we were all expecting, right? But also Saul. Also creepy Saul. Haunted at the funeral. Something over his left shoulder. And then runs away into the woods and is found crouched at the door of the church with his legs all torn up. A few things that I want to uh, dig into in that bit that we just read. One, the amazing line, uh, the amazing bit where, like, as soon as Frank dies, Dr. Ashton is like, well, I suppose there's no need to not ring the church bells now. I'll go let them know. <laughs> I'll go let them know we can ring the bells as planned. <laughs> of course, we, we, uh, we're we going to cancel them to try and help the boy with his recovery, but he's died now. So, um, yeah, ding dong, ding dong. <laughs> let them ring out. Um, yeah, bonkers. Um... The other thing is that um, Mrs. Ashton doesn't go to doesn't go to Frank's funeral because women did not then go to their kinsfolk's funerals. Bonkers! But Saul, oh Saul was there. Saul, who got him in clearly in touch with some kind of demon that killed him. Oh yeah, he's there. Frodo Baggins says better mauled Saul. These get better and better. Yep. Just bonkers. And the other thing is... Uh, yeah, just the fact that... Yeah, what was the message? So let's read that again. These, these were Frank's final... This was Frank's final message to Saul. This is what disturbed Saul so much when he heard it. This is dying Frank who said, No... I do not want to see him, but you should tell him I am afraid he will be very cold. Say to him, besides that, I am free of them now, but he should take care. <laughs> Sinister happenings. Okay. Well, there we go. We have concluded part one of the story. Let me know what you think of it so far. Am Aguero says, I'm loving the sound of the fire in the background. Thank you. I love the sound of the fire in the background. I can never hear it live. But whenever I, like, you know, see some of these streams back, I'm always like, ooh, ooh, it's nice with the fire. Yep. Seho says, that was only part one. Yep, that was only part one. We're only just getting started, folks. And we're going to be, we're going to be jumping straight into part two. So... Yeah, what did we think of that? I'm excited for the rest of Scuttlebot 101. Um, that escalated quickly, says Borgerom. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. Secret Agent Sam says, I like it so far. Can't wait to see what they unleashed. And Elise says, that was a good build-up. Double kill. Yeah. Surprising. Surprising. 
Rivendell Panda, we got some super chats. Thank you very much. Rivendell Panda says, I'm sorry I can't get to the end of this, but I need to do an archery zoom. Enjoy the spooky coins. Thank you very much, Rivendell Panda. Uh, great username, by the way. And an archery zoom. That sounds fun. I'm imagining it's an archery course or an archery lesson that takes place over Zoom. Um, and everyone has to set up a target in their in their living room. Um, and Nick Jeffrey says, So, Luke, happy to see the spookening, but I need to know, when will you succumb to the lure? Or should that be the ammo lure of KOA Reckoning? Oh, Nick Jeffrey. Oh, Nick Jeffrey, not for a long time. If I got into Kingdoms of Amalur the video game what would be the point i don't feel like there's any i uh, you know we are like we've got we've it, that we've got it covered we've got in we've got koa enthusiasm covered crossed off you know ellen's got it covered you don't need me don't get me wrong i think it's a great game i've played you know i've played a little bit of it you'd make ellen very happy says ginger hosley oh i know it would make her very happy. Uh, maybe I'll, maybe I'll, maybe I'll give it a go. It's a big old game though. It's big. It's quite an undertaking. I've got all that spelunky too to get through. Nimble Tax says this sort of talk gets you locked up in KOA jail. Yeah, it might do. It really might do. Might do. It sorry says I don't know if we could handle both Luke and Ellen being that enthusi enthusiastic about Kingdoms of Amalur. Yeah, yeah. That's a factor. It might be overwhelming. <laughs> okay, right. Presumit George says, besides, there's still not one million subscribers. Yeah, that's right. It was a one million subscriber goal that we mentioned, wasn't it? But then, but that was before re-reckoning happened. We weren't expecting that. Okay. Are we ready for part two? think we probably are so here we go dr ashton lived on for over 30 years in his prebendal house i do not know how quietly but without visible disturbance his successor preferred a house he already owned in the town and left that of the senior prebendary senior prebendary vacant between them, these two men saw the 18th century out and the 19th in, for Mr. Hines, the successor of Ashton, became prebendary at nine and twenty and died at nine and eighty. So that it was not till 1823 or 1824 that anyone succeeded to the post who intended to make the house his home. The man who did was Dr. Henry Aldous, whose name may be known to some of my readers as that of the author of a row of volumes labelled Aldous Works which occupy a place that must be honoured since it is so rarely touched upon the shelves of a substantial library, of many a substantial library. Dr. Aldous, his niece and his servants took some months to transfer furniture and books from his Dorsetshire parsonage to the quadrangle of Whitminster and to get everything in place. But eventually the work was done and the house, which though untenanted had always been kept sound and weather tight, woke up. And like Monte Cristo's mansion at Ortoy, lived, sang, and bloomed once more. On a certain morning in June, it looked especially fair, as Dr. Aldis strolled in his garden before breakfast and gazed over the red roof at the Minster Tower with its four gold vanes, backed by a very blue sky and very white little clouds. Mary, he said as he seated himself at the breakfast table and laid down something hard and shiny on the cloth. Here's a find which the boy made just now. You'll be sharper than I if you can guess what it's meant for. It was a round and perfectly smooth tablet, as much as an inch thick, of what seemed clear glass. It is rather attractive at all events, said Mary. She was a fair woman with light hair and large eyes, rather a devotee of literature. Yes, said her uncle. I thought you'd be pleased with it. I presume it came from the house. It turned up in the rubbish heap in the corner. I'm not sure that I do like it after all, said Mary some minutes later. Why in the world not, my dear? I don't know, I'm sure. Perhaps it's only fancy. 
Yes, only fancy and romance, of course. Uh, what's that book now? Uh, the name of that book, I mean, that, that you had in your head all yesterday. The talisman, uncle. Oh, if this should turn out to be a talisman, how enchanting it would be. Yes, the, the talisman. Oh, well, you're welcome to it, and whatever it is. Uh, I must be off about my business. Is all well in the house? Does it suit you? Uh, any complaints from the servants' hall? No, indeed, nothing could be more charming. The only soupcon of a complaint, besides the lack of a lock on the linen closet, which I told you of, is that Mrs. Maple says she cannot get rid of the sawflies out of that room you pass through at the other end of the hall. By the way, are you sure you like your bedroom? It is a long way off from anyone else you know. Like it? To be sure I do. The, the further off from you, my dear, the better. But there, don't think it necessary to beat me. Accept my apologies. But, but what are sawflies? Will they eat my coats? If not, they may have the room to themselves, what I care. We're not likely to be using it. No, of course not. Um, well, what she calls sawflies are those reddish things, like a daddy long legs, but smaller, and there are a great many of them perching about that room, certainly. I don't like them, but I don't fancy they are mischievous. There seem to be several things you don't like this fine morning, said her uncle as he closed the door. Miss Aldis remained in her chair, looking at the tablet, which she was holding in the palm of her hand. The smile that had been on her face faded slowly from it, and gave place to an expression of curiosity and almost strained attention. Her reverie was broken by the entrance of Mrs. Maple, and her invariable opening, "'Oh, Miss, could I speak to you a minute?' A letter from Miss Oldest to a friend in Lichfield, begun a day or two before, is the next source for this story. It is not devoid of traces of the influence of that leader of female thought in her day, Miss Anna Seward, known to some as the Swan of Lichfield. My sweetest Emily will be rejoiced to hear that we are, at length, my beloved uncle and myself, settled in the house that now calls us master, nay, master and mistress, as in past ages it has called so many others. Here we taste a mingling of modern elegance and hoary antiquity, such as has never ere now graced life for either of us. The town, small as it is, affords us some reflection, pale indeed, but veritable of the sweets of polite intercourse. The adjacent country numbers amid the occupants of its scattered mansions, some whose polish is annually refreshed by contact with metropolitan splendour, and others whose robust and homely geniality is, at times and by way of contrast, not less cheering and acceptable. Tired of the parlours and drawing-rooms of our friends, we have ready to hand a refuge from the clash of wits or the small talk of the day amid the solemn beauties of our venerable minster, whose sylvan chimes daily null us to prayer, and in the shady walks of whose tranquil graveyard we muse with softened heart, and ever and anon with moistened eye upon the memorials of the young, the beautiful, the aged, the wise, and the good. Here there is an abrupt break, both in the writing and the style. But, my dearest Emily, I can no longer write with the care which you deserve, and in which we both take pleasure. What I have to tell you is wholly foreign to what has gone before. This morning my uncle brought into breakfast an object which had been found in the garden. It was a glass of or, or crystal, a tablet of this shape, a, a little sketch is given, which he handed to me, and which, after he left the room, remained on the table by me. I gazed at it, I know not why, for some minutes till called away by the day's duties, and you will smile incredulously when I say that I seem to myself to begin to descry reflected in it objects and scenes which were not in the room where I was. You will not, however, be surprised that after such an experience I took the first opportunity to seclude myself in my room with what I now half believe to be a talisman of Micklemite. I was not disappointed. I assure you, Emily, by that memory which is dearest to both of us, that what I went through this afternoon transcends the limits of what I had before deemed credible. In brief, what I saw, seated in my bedroom, in the broad daylight of summer, and looking into the crystal depth of that small round tablet, was this. First, a prospect, strange to me, of an enclosure of rough and hillocky grass, with a grey stone ruin in the midst, and a wall of rough stones about it. In this stood an old and very ugly woman in a red cloak and ragged skirt, talking to a boy dressed in the fashion of maybe a hundred years ago. She put something which glittered into his hand, and he something into hers, which I saw to be money, 
for a single coin fell from her trembling hand into the grass. The scene passed. I, I should have remarked, by the way, that on the rough walls of the enclosure I could distinguish bones and even a skull lying in a disorderly fashion. Next I was looking upon two boys, one the figure of the former vision, the other younger. They were in a plot of garden, walled round, and this garden, in spite of the difference in arrangement and the small size of the trees, I could clearly recognise as being that upon which I now look from my window. The boys were engaged in some curious play, it seemed. Something was smouldering on the ground. The elder placed his hands upon it, and then raised them in what I took to be an attitude of prayer, and I saw and started at seeing that on them were deep stains of blood. The sky above was overcast, but the same boy now turned his face towards the wall of the garden, and beckoned with both his raised hands, and as he did so I was conscious that some moving objects were becoming visible over the top of the wall. Whether heads or other parts of some animal or human forms I could not tell. Upon the instant the elder boy turned sharply, seized the arm of the younger who all this time had been poring over what lay on the ground, and both hurried off. I then saw blood upon the grass, a little pile of bricks, and what I thought were black feathers scattered about. Well, that scene closed, and the next was so dark that perhaps the full meaning of it escaped me. But what I seemed to see was a form, at first crouching low among trees or bushes that were being threshed by a violent wind, then running very swiftly, and constantly turning a pale face to look behind him, as if he feared a pursuer. And indeed pursuers were following hard after him. Their shapes were but dimly seen, their number, three or, or four perhaps, only guessed. I suppose they were on the whole more like dogs than anything else. But dogs such as we have seen they assuredly were not. Could I have closed my eyes to this horror I would have done so at once, but I was helpless. The last I saw was the victim darting beneath an arch and clutching at some object to which he clung and those that were pursuing him overtook him, and I seemed to hear the echo of a cry of despair. It may be that I became unconscious. Certainly I had the sensation of awakening to the light of day after an interval of darkness. Such, in literal truth, Emily, was my vision. I can call it by no other name of this afternoon. Tell me, have I not been the unwilling witness of some episode of a tragedy connected with this very house? The letter is continued the next day. The tale of yesterday was not completed when I laid down my pen. I said nothing of my experiences to my uncle. You know yourself how little his robust common sense would be prepared to allow of them, and how in his eyes the specific remedy would be a, a black draught or a glass of port. After a silent evening, then, silent, not sullen, I retired to rest. Judge of my terror when, not yet in bed... I heard what I can only describe as a distant bellow, and knew it for my uncle's voice, though never in my hearing so exerted before. His sleeping room is at the further extremity of this large house, and to gain access to it one must traverse an antique hall some eighty feet long, and a lofty panelled chamber, and two unoccupied bedrooms. In the second of these, a room almost devoid of furniture, I found him, in the dark, his candle lying smashed on the floor. As I ran in, bearing a light, he clasped me in arms that trembled for the first time since I have known him, thanked God, and hurried me out of the room. He would say nothing of what had alarmed him. Tomorrow, tomorrow, was all I could get from him. A bed was hastily improvised for him in the room next to my own. I doubt if his night was more restful than mine. I could only get to sleep in the small hours when daylight was already strong, and then my dreams were of the grimmest particularly one which stamped itself on my brain, and which I must set down on the chance of dispersing the impression it's made. It was that I came up to my room with a heavy foreboding of evil oppressing me, and went with a hesitation and reluctance I could not explain to my chest of drawers. I opened the top drawer, in which was nothing but ribbons and handkerchiefs, and then the second, where was as little to alarm, and then, oh heavens, the third and last, and there was a mass of linen neatly folded. 
upon which, as I looked with curiosity that began to be tinged with horror, I perceived a movement in it, and a pink hand was thrust out of the folds and began to grope feebly in the air. I could bear it no more and rushed from the room, clapping the door after me, and strove with all my force to lock it. But the key would not turn in the wards, and, and from within the room came a sound of rustling and bumping, drawing nearer to the door. Why I did not flee down the stairs, I know not. I continued grasping the handle, and mercifully, as the door was plucked from my hand with an irresistible force, I awoke. You may not think this very alarming, but I assure you it was so to me. At breakfast today my uncle was very uncommunicative, and I think ashamed of the fright he had given us. But afterwards he inquired of me whether Mr. Spearman was still in town, adding that he thought he was a young man who had some sense left in his head. I think you know, my dear Emily, that I am not inclined to disagree with him there, and also that I am not inclined, uh, also that I was not unlikely to be able to answer his question. To Mr. Spearman he accordingly went, and I have not seen him since. I must send this strange budget, of, strange budget of news to you now, or it may have to wait over more than one post. Let's take a break. Let's take a break there. That's horrible. I love it, says Scuttlebot101. Yep. Just a, ha just a hand popping out of the drawer. Oh, uh, horrible. Uh, I think it's the... Um, the thing that I don't like about that isn't so much the hand popping out. It's the, um, it's the, it's the way that she runs, slams the door, and then, like, she can hear a kind of, like, rustling, kind of, like, thumping, kind of, like, coming closer, which is clearly the hand just kind of, like, or not just the hand, but, like, something climbing out of the drawer. Music addictor Annie Papaz says, okay, but that's very similar to some of my dreams. Alarming isn't even close. Oh, music addictor Annie Papaz, those, those sound like creepy dreams. Don't worry, you don't have to read too far into dreams. Creepy though. Hmm. There you go. Angela Sanchez says, yeah, big no on that. And our Saray says, well, shouldn't have picked the room that's the furthest away now, should he? That's <laughs> true. It's true, there's Uncle's punishment. Yep. <laughs> mm. Mm. Camberley House says that was way too well described. I'm ten hours away from trying, but I don't think sleep is going to be easy. Oh, we're not finished. We're not finished. I think that's a good, I think one of the things that makes that an effective and creepy scare, that hand in the drawer, is that it's the kind of thing that you read it and you're like, ooh, ooh creepy, nasty hand. But then I just know that the next time I go to open a drawer, I'm going to just catch myself just a moment before I open it. Probably as I open it, that's when the thinking distance will be. I'll, it'll be, I'll, I'll go automatically, I'll just open the drawer and as I'm pulling it open, I'll think, creepy hand, creepy hand, creepy hand. Mm. John Sharplin says hands don't belong in drawers and it's true it's so true Jane Cluett says I'm really into this there's a sliver of folk horror to it which is a bit out of James's usual wheelhouse yeah I think so um, we'll talk more about that at the end but yes this is this is the least MR James story of the M.R. James stories that we've read, I think. I mean, it's still pretty M.R. James, don't get me wrong. But, um, yeah. Summoning demons, devils, the hand. At the moment, there's just everything going on here. We've got the, we've got the creepy hand. We've got the things that she saw in the vision pursuing Saul. I mean, I think we can assume it's Saul from the, from the description. I mean, what did we learn there? In the dream, she saw a hideously ugly old woman giving giving Saul, I assume Saul, that mirror. Um, she saw the, the, the blood sacrifice of the cockerel and things appearing behind the wall, over the wall, behind the two, behind the two kids. So we saw that. 
and uh, and then we had the things chasing down Saul, presumably chasing him and killing him. I, the way that they're described is a little creepy as well. Um, how is it described? Um, I suppose they were on the whole more like dogs than anything else. That is a that is a great that is that is that is exactly the kind of thing that I like that Mr. James does. It's just very elegant, very elegant way of putting it. Rather than describing this horrible demon Resident Evil zombie dog, which I know you're all now picturing, but just more like dogs than anything else. That tells you everything you need to know. That they are like dogs, but they're not dogs. Yeah. Dan says, just assume that all drawers have disembodied hands in them and then you'll be fine. I'll be fine until I need to get something out, you know, so I need to get some socks out my sock drawer. Oh god, what if the hand came out wearing a sock? <laughs> like a sock puppet. <laughs> oh, oh no. The real horror. Okay, right. Well, that's made me laugh and freaked me out. Okay. I think we're ready to crack on. Oh, we've got some uh, had some super chats coming. Thank you so much, um, Philip Ratkovich. He says just joining the pay because I got a go club. <laughs> thank you very much, Philip. Much appreciated. Um, and none your business. Thank you very much for the for the tip as well. Very kind. Very very kind. Hmm. Okay. Shall we crack on? We're approaching the end game. Connie the Burb says he only uses small descriptions. It just makes them all the more creepy. That is so, so true. All right. Here we go. The reader will not be far out if he guesses that Miss Mary and Mr. Spearman made a match of it not very long after this month of June. Mr. Spearman was a young spark who had a good property in the neighbourhood of Whitminster, and not unfrequently about this time spent a few days at the King's Head, ostensibly on business. But he must have had some leisure, for his diary is copious, especially for the days of which I am telling the story. It is probable to me that he wrote this episode as fully as he could, at the bidding of Miss Mary. Uncle Oldis, how I hope I may have the right to call him so before long, called this morning. After throwing out a good many short remarks on indifferent topics, he said, I wish, Spearman, you'd listen to an old story and keep a close tongue about it just for a bit till I get more light on it. To be sure, said I, you may count on me. I don't know what to make of it, he said. You know my bedroom. It's well away from everyone else's, and I, I pass through the Great Hall and two or three other rooms to get to it. It's at the end the end that's next to the Minster, then? I asked. Yes, it is. Well, now, yesterday morning my Mary told me that the room next before it was infested with some sort of fly that the housekeeper couldn't get rid of. And that may be the explanation, or it may not. What do you think? Why, said I, you've not yet told me what has to be explained. Oh, true enough, uh, no, I don't believe I have. Uh, but by the by, what are these uh, sawflies? What's the size of them? Well, I began to wonder if he was touched in the head. What I call a sawfly, I said very patiently, is a red animal, like a daddy long legs, but not so big, perhaps an inch long, perhaps less. It's very hard in the body, and to me... I was going to say, particularly offensive, but he broke in. Uh, come, come, an inch or less, that won't do. I can only tell you, I said, what I know. Would it not be better if you told me from first to last what it is that has puzzled you, and then I may be able to give you some kind of an opinion? Well, he gazed at me meditatively. Perhaps it would, he said. I told Mary only today that I knew you had some vestiges of sense in your head. I bowed my acknowledgments. The thing is, I've, I've an odd kind of shyness about talking about it. Uh, nothing of the sort has happened to me before. Well, about eleven o'clock last night, or, or after, I took my candle and set out for my room. 
I had a book in my other hand. I, I always read something for a few minutes before I drop off to sleep. A dangerous habit. I don't recommend it. But I know how to manage my light and my bed curtains. Now then, first, as I stepped out of my study into the great half that's next to it and shut the door, my candle went out. I supposed I'd clapped the door behind me too quick and made a draught. and I was annoyed, for I'd no tinderbox nearer than my bedroom. But I knew my way well enough and went on. The next thing was that my book was struck out of my hand in the dark. If I said twitched out of my hand, it would better express the sensation. It fell on the floor. I picked it up and went on, more annoyed than before and a little startled. But as you know, that hall has many windows without curtains, and in summer nights like these it's easy to not only see where the furniture is, but whether there's anyone or anything moving, and there was no one, nothing of the kind. So I went on through the hall and through the audit chamber next to it, which also has big windows, and then into the bedrooms which lead to my own, where the curtains were drawn, and I had to go slower because of steps here and there. Well, it was in the second of these rooms that I nearly got my quietus. The moment I opened the door of it, I, I felt there was something wrong. I thought twice, I confess, whether I shouldn't turn back and find another way there is to my room, rather than go through that one. Then I was ashamed of myself and thought what people call better of it, though I don't know about better in this case. If I was to describe my experience exactly... I should say this. There was a, a dry, light, rustling sound all over the room as I went in. And then, remember, it's perfectly dark, something seemed to rush at me. And there was, I don't know how to put it, a sensation of long, thin arms or legs or feelers all about my face and neck and body. Very little strength in them there seemed to be, but... Spearman, I don't think I was ever more horrified or disgusted in all my life. And it does take something to put me out. I roared out as loud as I could and, and have flung away my candle at random. And knowing I was near the window, I, I tore at the curtain and somehow let in enough light to be able to see something waving. Which I knew was an insect's leg by the shape of it. But, but Lord, what a size. Why, the beast much have, must have been as tall as I am. And now you say sawflies are an inch long or less. What do you make of it, Spearman? For goodness sake, finish your story first, I said. I never heard anything like it. Oh, said he. Oh, there's no more to tell. Mary ran in with a light and there was nothing there. I didn't tell her what was the matter. I changed my room for last night and I expect for good. Have you searched this odd room of yours? I said. What do you keep in it? We don't use it, he answered. Uh, there's an old press there and some little other furniture. And in the press, said I. I don't know. Uh, I never saw it opened. Uh, but I do know that it's locked. Well, I should have it looked into. Uh, and if you had time, I own to having some curiosity to see the place myself. Well, I didn't exactly like to ask you, but that's a... Uh, Rather what I'd hope you'd say. Uh, name your time and I'll take you there. No time like the present, I said at once, for I saw he would never settle down to anything while this affair was in suspense. He got up with great alacrity and looked at me, I am tempted to think, with marked approval. Come along, was all he said, however, and it was pretty silent all the way to his house. My Mary, as he calls her in public and I in private, was summoned and we proceeded to the room. The doctor had gone so far as to tell her that he had something of a fright there last night, of what nature he had not yet divulged, but now he pointed out and described very briefly the incidents of his progress. When we were near the important spot, he pulled up and allowed me to pass on. There's the room, he said. Go in, Spearman, and tell us what you find. Well, whatever I might have felt at midnight, noonday, I was sure, would keep back anything sinister, and I flung the door open with an air and stepped in. It was a well-lighted room, with its large window on the right, though not, I thought, a very airy one. The principal piece of furniture was the gaunt old press of dark wood, 
There was, too, a four-post bedstead, a, a mere skeleton which could hide nothing, and there was a chest of drawers. On the windowsill and the floor near it were the dead bodies of many hundred sawflies, and one torpid one which I had some satisfaction in killing. I tried the door of the press but could not open it. The drawers, too, were locked. Somewhere I was conscious there was a faint rustling sound, but I could not locate it, and when I made my report to those outside I said nothing of it. But, I said, clearly the next thing was to see what was in those locked receptacles. Old Aldis turned to Mary. Miss Maple, he said, and Mary ran off. No one, I am sure, steps like her, and soon came back at a soberer pace with an elderly lady of discreet aspect. "'Have you the keys of these things, Mrs. Maple?' said Uncle Oldys. His simple words let loose a torrent, not violent but copious, of speech. Had she been a shade or two higher in the social scale, Mrs. Maple could have stood as the model for Miss Bates. "'Oh, Doctor and Miss, and you too, sir,' she said, acknowledging my presence with a bend. "'Them keys! Who was that again that came when first we took over things in the house? A gentleman in business it was.' "'and I gave him his luncheon in the small parlour "'on account of us not having everything "'as we should like to see it in the large one. "'Chicken and apple pie and a glass of Madeira. "'Oh, dear, dear, you'll say I'm running on, Miss Mary, "'but I only mention it to bring back my recollection. "'And there it comes. "'Gardener, just the same as it did last week "'with the artichokes and the text of the sermon. "'Now, that Mr Gardener, "'every key I got from him was labelled to itself, "'and each and every one was a key "'of some door or another in this house.' And sometimes too, and when I say door, my meaning is door of a room, not like such a press as this is. Yes, Miss Mary, I know full well, and I'm just making it clear to your uncle and you too, sir. Ah, but there was a box which this same gentleman gave over into my charge, and thinking no harm after he was gone, I took the liberty, knowing it was your uncle's property, to rattle it. And unless I'm most surprisingly deceived, in that box there was keys. But what keys? That, Doctor, is known elsewhere. If I opened the box, no, that I would not do. I wondered that old uh, that Uncle Aldis remained as quiet as he did under this address. Mary, I knew, was amused by it, as he probably had been taught by experience that it was useless to break in upon it. At any rate, he did not, but merely said at the end, "'Have you that box handy, Mrs. Maple? If so, you might bring it here.' Mrs. Maple pointed her finger at him, either in accusation or in gloomy triumph. "'There!' she said. Was I to choose out the very words out of your mouth, Doctor, them would be the ones. And if I've took it to my own rebuke one half a dozen times, it's been nearer fifty. Laid awake I have in my bed, sat down in my chair I have. The same you and Miss Mary gave me the day I was twenty year in your service, and no person could desire a better... Yet, Yes, Miss Mary, but it is the truth. And well we know who it is, I would have it differently if he could. "'All very well,' says I to myself, "'but pray when the doctor calls you to account for that box, "'what are you going to say?' "'No, doctor, if you were some masters I've heard of "'and I was some servants I could name, "'I should have an easy task before me, "'but things being humanely speaking what they are, "'the one course open to me is just to say that you, "'that without Miss Mary comes to my room "'and helps me to my recollection, "'which her wits may manage what slipped by on mine, "'no such box as that, small though it may be, "'will cross your eyes this many a day to come.' "'Why, dear Mrs Maple, "'why didn't you tell me before "'that you wanted me to help you find it?' "'said my Mary. "'No, never mind telling me why it was. "'Let us come at once and look for it.' and they hastened off together. I could hear Mrs. Maple beginning an explanation, which, I doubt not, lasted into the furthest recesses of the housekeeper's department. Uncle Aldis and I were left alone. A valuable servant, he said, nodding towards the door. Nothing goes wrong under her. Um, the speeches are seldom over three minutes. How will Miss Aldis manage to make her remember about the box? I asked. To Mary, oh, she'll make her sit down and ask her about her aunt's last illness, or who gave her the china dog on the mantelpiece, or something quite off the point. Then, as Maple says, one thing brings up another, and the right one will come round sooner than you could suppose. Oh, there, I believe I hear them coming back already. It was indeed so, and Mrs. Maple was hurrying on ahead of Mary with the box in her outstretched hand and a beaming face. 
What was it? She cried as she drew near. What was it as I said before ever I come out of Dorset here to this place? Not that I'm a Dorset woman myself, nor had need to be. Safe bind, safe find. And there it was in the place where I'd put it. What, two months back, I dare say. She handed it to Uncle Aldous, and he and I examined it with some interest, so that I ceased to pay attention to Mrs. Anne Maple for the moment, though I know that she went on to expound exactly where the box had been and in what way Mary had helped to refresh her memory on the subject. It was an oldish box, tied with pink tape and sealed, and on the lid was pasted a label inscribed in old ink, The Senior Prebendary's House, Whitminster. On being opened, it was found to contain two keys of moderate size, and a paper, on which, in the same hand as the label, was keys of the press and box of drawers standing in the disused chamber. Also this. The effects in this press and box are held by me, and to be held by my successors in the residence, in trust for the noble family of Kildonan, if claim be made by any survivor of it. I, having made all the inquiry possible to myself, am of the opinion that the noble house is wholly extinct, the last earl having been, as is notorious, cast away at sea, and his only child and heir deceased in my house. The papers as to which melancholy casualty were by me reposed in the same press in this year of our Lord 1753 on the 21st of March. I am further of the opinion that unless grave discomfort arrive, such persons not being of the family of Kildonan, as shall become possessed of these keys, will be well advised to leave matters as they are, which opinion I do not express without weighty and sufficient reason, and am happy to have my judgment confirmed by other members of this college and church who are conversant with the events referred to in this paper. Ah, said Uncle Aldous, grave discomfort. So uh, he thought there might be something. I suspect it was that young man, he went on, pointing with the key to the line about the only child and heir. Eh, hey, Mary, uh, the, the Viscounty of Kildonan was Saul. How do you know that, uncle? said Mary. Oh, why not? It's all in Debret, uh, two fat little books. Uh, but I meant the tomb by the lime walk. He's there. What's the story, I wonder? Do you know it, Mrs. Maple? Uh, and by the way, look at your sawflies by the window there. Mrs. Maple, thus confronted with two subjects at once, was a little put to it to do justice to both. It was no doubt rash in Uncle Oldest to give her the opportunity. I could only guess that he had some slight hesitation about using the key he held in his hand. Oh, them flies, how bad they was, Doctor and Miss, this three or four days. And you too, sir, you wouldn't guess none of you. And how they come to. First we took the room in hand, the shutters was up. And has been seen, I dare say, years upon years, and not a fly to be seen. Then we got the shutter bars down with a good deal of trouble and left it so for the day. And the next day I sent Susan in with the broom to sweep out. And not two minutes hadn't passed when she come out into the hall like a blind thing. And we had to regular beat them off of her. Why, her cap and her hair. You couldn't see the colour of it, I do assure you. And all clustering round her eyes, too. Fortunate enough she's not a girl with fancies, else if it had been me, why, only the tickling of the nasty things would have drove me out of my wits. And now they lay so like so like so many dead things. Well, they was lively enough on the Monday, and now here's Thursday, is it, or, or no, uh, Friday, only to come near the door and you'd hear them pattering up against it. And once you opened it, dash at you they would, as if they'd eat you. I couldn't help thinking to myself, if you was bats, where should we be this night? Nor you can't crush them like the usual kind of a fly. Well, there's something to be thankful for if we could but learn by it. And this tomb, too, she said, hastening on to her second point to elude any chance of interruption. Of them two poor young lads, I say poor, and yet when I recollect myself, I was at tea with Mrs Simpkins, the sexton's wife, before you come, Doctor and Miss Mary. And that's a family has been in the place, oh, what, I dare say, a hundred years in that very house and could put their hand on any tomb or yet grave in all the yard and give you name and age. And his account of that young man, Mr. Simpkins, is, uh, I mean to say, well. She compressed her lips and nodded several times. Tell us, Mrs. Maple, said Mary. Go on, said Uncle Aldous. 
"'What about him?' said I. "'Never was such a thing seen in this place, "'not since Queen Mary's times, and the Pope and all,' said Mrs. Maple. "'Why, do you know he lived in this very house, "'him and them that was with him, "'and for all I can tell in this identical room?' "'She shifted her feet uneasily on the floor. "'He was with him. "'Do you mean the, the people of the house?' "'said Uncle Aldous suspiciously.' Not to call people, Doctor, dear, no, was the answer. Uh, more what he brought with him from Ireland, I believe it was. No, the people in the house were the last to hear anything of his goings on. But in the town, not a family but knew how he stopped out at night. And them that was with him, why, there were such as would strip the skin from a child in its grave. And a withered heart makes an ugly thin ghost, says Mr Simpkins. But they turned on him at the last, he says. And there's the mark still to be seen on the minster door where they run him down. And that's no more than the truth, for I got him to show it to him, to me myself. And that's what he said. A lord he was, with a Bible name of a wicked king, whatever his godfathers could have been thinking of. Saul was the name, said Uncle Aldous. To be sure, it was uh, Saul, Doctor. And thank you. Uh, and now, isn't it King Saul that we read of raising up the dead ghost that was slumbering in its tomb till he disturbed it? And isn't that a strange thing, this, this young lord to have such a name? Yeah, and Mrs. Simpkins' grandfather to see him out of his window on a dark night, going about from one grave to another, in the yard with a candle. And them that was with him, following through the grass at his heels. And one night, him to come right up to old Mr. Simpkins' window that gives on to the yard and press his face against it to find out if there was anyone in the room who could see him. And only just time there was for old Mr. Simpkins to drop down like, quiet just under the window and hold his breath, and not stir till he heard him stepping away again, and this rustling like in the grass after him as he went. And then when he looked out the window in the morning, there was treadings in the grass and a dead man's bone. Oh, he was a cruel child for certain, but he had to pay in the end and after. After, said Uncle Aldous with a frown. Oh, yes, Doctor. Night after night in old Mr. Simpkins' time, and his son. That's our Mr. Simpkins' father. Yes, and our own Mr. Simpkins too. Up against the same window, particular when they've had a fire of a chilly evening, with his face right on the panes, and his hands fluttering out, and his mouth open and shut open and shut for a minute or more, and then gone off in the dark yard. But open the window at such times, no, that they dare not do. Though they could find it in their heart to pity the poor thing, that pinched up with the cold, and seemingly fading away to a nothing as the years passed on. Well, indeed, I believe it is no more than the truth what our Mr Simpkins says on his own grandfather's word. A withered heart makes an ugly thin ghost. I dare say, said Uncle Aldous suddenly, so suddenly that Mrs. Maple stopped short. Uh, thank you. Uh, come away, all of you. Why, Uncle, said Mary, are you not going to open the press after all? Uncle Aldous blushed, actually blushed. My dear, he said, you are at liberty to call me a coward or applaud me as a prudent man, whichever you please. But I am neither going to open that press nor that chest of drawers myself. Nor am I going to hand over the keys to you or any other person. Mrs. Maple, will you kindly see about getting a man or two to move those pieces of furniture into the garret? And when they do it, Mrs. Maple, said Mary, who seemed to me, I did not then know why, more relieved than disappointed by her uncle's decision, I have something that I want to put with the rest, only quite a small packet. We left that curious room not unwillingly, I think. Uncle Aldous's orders were carried out that same day. And so, concludes Mr. Spearman, Whitminster has so a Bluebeard's chamber, and I'm rather inclined to suspect a jack-in-the-box, awaiting some future occupant of the residence of the senior prebendary. And that's the end. And that's the end. An abrupt ending, I think. They don't open the press. They do the thing that in every horror movie you're like, don't go in there. Don't do it. They actually don't. They're like, you know what? Put it all in the attic. I don't 
don't I don't need to get involved. <laughs> I like it. I like it. As an... <laughs> when I was reading it, I was like, "Come on, what's in the what's in the press? What's in the drawers?" And we never find out. But I think we can assume that it's demon dogs and a creepy pink hand and an insect leg the size of a human leg. Oh, that bit was horrible. Oh. Should we read the description of that again? Should we do that to ourselves? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Why not? Where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Uh, there, uh, this is Mrs. Maple. God, Miss. We'll talk about Mrs. Maple in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, here we go. I won't do the voice. There was a dry, light rustling sound all over the room as I went in. And then, you remember it was perfectly dark, something seemed to rush at me. And there was, I don't know how to put it, a sensation of long, thin arms or legs or feelers all about my face and neck and body. Very little strength in them there seemed to be. But Spearman, I don't think I was ever more horrified or disgusted in all my life. And it does take something to put me out. I roared out as loud as I could and flung away my candle at random and knowing I was near the window I tore at the curtain and somehow let in enough light to be able to see something waving which I knew was an insect's leg by the shape of it but lord what a size why the beast must have been as tall as I am and now you tell me sawflies are an inch long or less what do you make of it Spearman? Okay as usual with M.R. James, when it actually comes to the creepiness, there's one particular word or there's one particular turn of phrase that just, for me, completely makes the whole thing so horrible. And in that example, it was very little strength in them. It's the idea that there could be this huge insect just like, kind of like at your face, but weakly, like just no strength. Oh, oh worse somehow worse somehow worse and then i mean mr he's mr james bless him he's leaving nothing on the table this time we've got zombie dogs we've got giant insects i'm imagining like a praying mantis also let's talk about this bless uncle oldest what a sweetie that he went to talk to Spearman, having been attacked by a person-sized insect, and was like, I've heard that this room in my house is full of sawflies. Out of curiosity, how big is a sawfly? And they're like, I don't know, like the size of a fly? And they're like, oh, hmm, okay, yeah, it's probably not that that clawed at my face. Yeah, no, Uncle Oldest, it's not that that clawed at your face. There are no bugs. It... Someone would have mentioned, if the if the room was infested with bugs the size of people, someone would have said something. Bless you, Uncle Oldest. I think he's a sweetie. Absolutely praying mantis, says Connie the Burb. Oh, we got some um, super chats come in. Thank you very much. Let's read some of them. Very generous. Uh, Andrew D says, another great story and a great reading. You are destined for a life on the stage, Luke. Thanks, Andrew G. That's nice of you to say. Um, and James Veerkamp says, giving back to my favourite creators for my birthday. Happy birthday, James Veerkamp. That's awesome. Happy birthday. Uh, thank you, Luke, for being such a positive presence for us all and your great voice acting. This isn't enough for an appropriate cask of Amontillado, but at least a bottle. Oh, thank you. That's thank you. That's really kind. Thank you, James Veerkamp. And happy birthday. Uh, Jan Stenholt says, much better and much worse not to know. Yeah, not to know what's in the drawer. Gentle Mandrill says, what a great story. What I like about MR James is the slow build up and then suddenly, bam, hand in the drawer and bugs. And the subtle description of the things, just enough to imagine the worst. Also, Mrs. Maple's voice was great. Good. I'm glad you thought so, Gentle Mandrill, because quite early on, I realised, oh, no, I've committed to this and then remembered quite how much Mrs. Maple dialogue there was. <laughs> I was like, I started doing the voice and then I thought, oh, no, this is the character who runs on and on and on and, never, and won't shut up. 
and I had some regrets, but I'm sure it's fine. Fran Fry says, oh my god, they actually did a smart thing. I almost cried because giant insect, nope. No, thank you. Burn it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hard agree, Fran Fry. Rogue Monster says, definitely an excellent story I was able to tune into the live version for. Um, yeah, all right, let's talk about Mrs. Maple. Nimble Tax says, Mrs. Maple was a strange story edition. A big chunk of comedy amidst all the horror. Yeah, so, like, in these stories we read, not a lot of comedy beats. Not a lot of deliberate comedy beats. I mean, there's the horse of the invisible, which was unintentionally the funniest thing. <laughs> Oh no, I thought about Oh no, I thought about the horse of the invisible. <laughs> I know how I'll win her back. I'll dress as a great big horse. <laughs> I'll dress as a great big horse and kick her fiance to death. <laughs> oh god, right now we can't go down that road again. I have to I have to must have uh, yeah, all right, all right. Yeah, so I thought it was odd, not unwelcome, but odd, for M.R. James, who doesn't do a lot of comedy in his stories, to suddenly, right near the end, introduce a pure comedy character. Although, I say pure comedy character, but Mrs. Maple, like, she does the thing where, like, she won't stop talking and no one can interrupt her. Sidebar, I think it's genuinely really funny, the bit where Mrs. Maple... And Mary leave, and then the two blokes just like stood in the corridor, and there's like a bit of uh, silence, and then uh, Uncle Oldest is like, "She's a very good servant." <laughs> <laughs> What's he say exactly? Oh yeah, a valuable servant. Nothing goes wrong under her. The speeches are seldom over three minutes, <laughs> and then. <laughs> and then someone accidentally asks her about two subjects and it's like oh no <laughs> but then having been kind of a, a sort of source of comedy she then goes on to describe some of the like genuine horror because she's the one who gets uh, an account from the Simpkinses about the ghost of Saul pressing up against the window and like even after Saul is dead and like getting fainter and fainter and fainter and being followed all, all like with with the with you know demons with him which is very creepy um mm. and we get the uh, we get the line from which this short story collection gets its title there uh mr simpkin says on his own grandfather's word a withered heart makes an ugly thin ghost and this collection is called uh a thin ghost uh and others um which I really like. So yeah, so Mrs. Maple, yeah, she does get to sort of deliver some genuine horror. Also, just M.R. James has this habit of, and, and this is this is fine, I like it, and when you're reading it, it's not a problem, but, but narratively, the story is so nested because he never really wants to just give you a straight account of what's happening. He wants to read you a letter. And so at this point, we've got Mrs. Maple recalling a conversation that she had with the Simpkinses as related in the notes of Spearman and it's Spearman's letter or just diary Spearman's diary that the author M.R. James you the reader it, it is reading so it's it's this dent these densely layered sort of um narratives um but it's cool right let's talk about the uh Let's talk about the demon. Let's do, let's talk about what let's talk about the monsters. Let's talk about what let's talk about what was actually going on. Um Yeah. So there was something mentioned like uh uh more what he brought with him from Ireland. So I think there's some implication that Saul came over from Ireland followed by these demons that would certainly make sense with the fact that when you know the first thing he did was show up get out of the chase and um freak out a horse uh so you know that makes sense to me but um yeah but then on the other hand 
I don't know. I guess it depends at what point does he start summoning stuff. Like that the ugly old lady who's described as like uh you know, like giving him that mirror. Where's she? Is she in Ireland before he sets sail or I don't know. Maybe. Becky S has loved the foreshadowing of how far the uncle's room was away from Mary's. Yep, that was good. That was good. <laughs> yeah, that was cool. And I think it's that that gives this story this kind of like folksy quality, like this idea that that he's meddling in some sort of folksy, rural, very old magic, trying to you know, see the future and you know, obviously like bring something bring something through Elise says yeah what were the not dogs then I don't know I mean there are obviously a lot of like actual demons in this story but there's just, just you just you get them all giant insects dogs creepy hands there's no consistent single enemy or villain or like creepy thing in this and I think that's I think that's one of the uh I think that's one of the, I think that's one of the things I like about it to be honest. Um he was described as possessed at the beginning wasn't he says H Grav. Yes, that is a very good point. You get let's that's how the how is how exactly it yeah. Uh you'll find him whimsical or of late I've thought him so. This is Saul. And to confirm this was only today his old nurse uh came expressly to tell me he was possessed. But let that pass. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I'm sending you a possessed boy, FYI. He might kill your um, nephew who lives with you. I think it was a nephew. A nephew. I think, it was, I think Frank was a nephew, I think. Mm. So, there we go. We've had the story. Um, another thing that I like about it is that I feel like these kind of stories do hang around in your mind a little bit afterwards because it's not it's not made completely clear what happened. I think if you think about it, put it all together, especially on rereading it as well, it all seems to hang together. There's a pretty sort of clear chronological, you know, you can put together an account of what happened. Saul, I guess, in Ireland gets involved in, you know, weird freaky magic that he shouldn't, is sent away to England. There he gets, uh, um, there he, get, he starts doing rituals and stuff and includes... Uh, Frank, the little boy Frank, obviously gets in over his head because as Frank dies, uh, he says, like, oh, I'm a bit worried you'll be cold, Saul. Anyway, then Saul is chased through the woods by demons and killed. Uh, everything to do with this is kind of like, you know, locked up and put in some boxes. That mirror, uh, the mirror that they were using in the summoning ritual, sort of comes to, you know, the, the tablet. Uh, comes to be found by Mary, and I think that I think it's that that she mentions. That's that's got to be the small parcel right at the very end of the story, um, where uh, Mary says, um, "When they when they put it all in the attic, Mrs. Maple, um, I have something that I want to put with the rest. Only quite a small packet. You know that that's that's got to be the um, that's got to be there." Um, that's got to be the, the haunted mirror. Nimble Tax says, looking up the residents at Whitminster in Google Image Search gives some freaky results. Oh yeah, well let's see. Let's see some old. Let's see some illustrations based on the. Ooh. Oh yeah, there we go. Big old insects. Ah. Oh. Creepy drawing of Saul, dead on the church steps. Ooh, tell you what, some good fan art though. Oh, oh yeah, there's some creepy stuff here. Ooh. Blah, blah, blah. Not a fan. And what is that? Some sort of monster made of hair? Right, at this point I'm just looking at Google Image. That's not very good live streaming, is it? Yeah, pretty, um, pretty... Creepy stuff. A bit bloodborne, really, says Danny McNamara. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Especially the dogs and the 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 sort of insect creatures. Insect beasts. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
Connie the Burb says this manner would make a great Resident Evil game. Yeah, it'd be a good Resident Evil game if um, your Leon Kennedy could just be like, uh, yeah, I'm not gonna go. I'm not gonna go around this house. Uh, put it all in the attic. It's creepy as well. Um, obviously, the first time I was reading it, I was like, come on, open the thing. I want to see, I want the horrible thing. Especially knowing I was going to read this live. I was like, I want there to be a huge, big, spectacular scare in the press. And I want it to kill everyone or something. And, and it'll be, and, you know, and it'll be really, really fun and exciting to read. But uh, as usual, it's probably more chilling if we don't get answers on what's in there. And we just know that the... That stuff is up there in the attic and that someone at some point is for sure going to open it. Frankie Ace's real question though. Did the uncle move his bedroom closer to his family after all the horror? I think so. I think so. I think so because he does mention like, oh, that'll be the last time I go, in, you know, the last time I'm in that room. Oh, Elise says, reminds me of the blood flies from Dishonored a bit. Yes, that's what I would... That's what, There was something... It's the fact they're described as... Oh, like, oh the, the description of the insects is horrible. They're described as like a daddy long legs, which I don't know it, what's... Is daddy long legs a thing in the US? I'm thinking of international viewers. Daddy long legs. Uh, cellar spider? If cellar spider is a is a thing that you're familiar with, Ginger Hosley says, sure are. They're non-scary spiders. Lots of daddy long legs here in the States. Okay, cool. It's a thing in the US, but it is a spider. Yeah, that's right. It is a spider. Yeah, they're described like um, they're described like that, but a bit smaller and red and hard. So you can't squish them, which is horrible. There is a footnote. If we're going to get entomological about this, there is a footnote to this story. Um, uh near by the description of the flies and the footnote says um apparently the ichnumon ich fly ophion obscurum and not the true saw fly is meant so a saw fly okay yeah i'm looking at a saw fly now oh god i wish i hadn't looked that up oh god oh bugs really give me the creeps especially anything that looks a bit waspy oh i wish i hadn't looked at that but it's all in service of, of info. Um, yeah, Ophion Obscurum. Ophion, O-P-H-I-O-N, Obscurum, O-B-S-C-U-R-U-M. That apparently, according to this footnote, is actually the kind of thing that was that was meant. And it does look more like a kind of, a more delicate kind of wispy, uh, yeah, o almost a bit more mosquito-ish ish more like a flying ant maybe yeah mm. no 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 why i googled <laughs> says giacomo montanari i'm sorry i'm sorry john sharpin says ah kind of like a mosquito hawk yeah that is exactly the kind of thing that you do not want um to uh burst out of a room and like be like attacking your eyes and crawling around and craw you know that's that's how they're described isn't it it's like um going for the eyes yeah not good not good not good at all still cool story i like how long it is longer than most mr james short stories i think that we've read um, it feels a bit epic because it kind of has that uh, thing where it sort of spans time. I don't know what we're going to do next time. Um, I have mentioned maybe doing some early sci-fi. Uh, I do have a story picked out for that. Not going to say what it is, um, but uh, I've only only done. I've only got one. I've only read one bit of early sci-fi. Then I'm like, yes, this will be good for the stream. So um, uh, yeah, we'll. Uh, I'll get to that as soon as I've uh, done the thing that I'm really looking forward to doing, which is like making a background, you know, making the sort of like sci-fi equivalent of the fireplace background. I've made a little start, but 
I don't know. I'm I'm a uh, I'm I'm a bit pressed for time recently. I've got a few I've got a few things on. I'm trying to trying to sort of get so, get a bit of get a bit of music um in the bank. Uh get a bit of yeah, get a bit of music done, recorded. But um ah, you know, there's only so much time in the day. I'm trying to uh trying not to um put too many demands on myself. Um Yeah, so cool story. Now, if uh, if if you are thinking of um, uh, if you are you know if you're still on YouTube and you're looking for um, something else to watch, uh, my good friend Andy Hoyle, who um, I'm sure many of you will have heard mentioned before, um, he's doing a live stream at 9 p.m., which is in 15 minutes. Uh, he's going to be editing photo. He's an amazing photographer, an incredible photo editor as well. Uh, he's going to be um, doing to quote him chilled out lightroom edits he's got cozy sweaters he's got a mug that looks like how to describe this he's got a mug that looks like it's made of cardigan okay and look the only way you're gonna figure out exactly what i mean by that is by checking the link that i'm popping in chat now um yeah have a look at have a look at that it's really quite it's quite the mug uh, yeah, so there you go. Bit of um, if 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 you're in the if you're in the mood for for something else, what do we tell Andy? Says Secret Agent Sam. Yeah, good question. What should, what should you pop, go over there and pop in the chat? Um, I guess you should probably head over there and say, um, I'm trying to think of something from the story. I always want to be good. I always want. I always want the thing you pop into the chat and say. Um, what was it that Mrs. Maple uh, said? Um, I'm gonna find it. There's something that she shouts out that made me laugh. <laughs> Hang on, sorry. And now I'm just trying to read my way through, back through the book. <laughs> oh, it was nothing. It was just like, what was it? Oh, that was rubbish. Um, um, go and say... Uh, go and say... There we go. I'm going with Donald Backlot's suggestion. Just say that Mrs. Maple sent you. Say, yeah, just head on over to, to Andy's chat and say, uh, Mrs. Maple sent me. That's what I want you to say. In fact, I've got I've got it open now. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna look. I'm gonna wait and see you see you pop over there. I'm gonna see I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna read it. I've got an online live stream I'm now reading Andy's chat. I'm gonna wait. I'm gonna wait. <laughs> pop the link in again if um it's been a little while <laughs> fancy space owl mrs maple sent us <laughs> mrs maple sent a nimble tack rebecca m rebecca m says uh mrs maple sent me hello mrs maple sent her regards says oh sorry <laughs> yeah there we go <laughs> mrs maple sent us says growly <laughs> oh this has amused me no end oh that's great i'm gonna screenshot this <laughs> Mrs. Maple is a bloody hero, says Andy in the chat. Yeah, she is. She is. Right, well, um, I will leave you in Andy's capable hands then. If you do fancy hopping over, watching some photo editing, uh, I find those streams really relaxing. Um, he takes great photos. I'm not very... I, I'm, I suck at photography, um, uh, but I do enjoy photo editing a lot more because uh, I have to do quite a lot of Photoshop for my job. So I can't do the stuff with the camera, but I get a lot from just watching Andy, like punch up images and actually if you've got a photo on your phone that you're like hey this this picture is nice i took a good picture of a thing i took a good picture close-up picture of a sawfly if only i could somehow enhance it and make it look good I, I i guarantee that you will learn at least something from from uh from watching andy just do the thing that he is so professionally skilled at um on a live stream yeah so enjoy that oh, i'm really enjoying this really enjoying all the mrs maple stuff Right. 
Okay. I am going to love you and leave you then, folks. Thank you again so much for joining. Uh, we will see you next time. Um, as always, you know the rules. Stay safe out there. Wear your mask. Uh, and until next time, you know what you got to do, folks. you got to remain unhaunted. Uh, Charles Snow, thank you very much for the last minute super chat. He says, thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to do this for us. Please don't put too much pressure on yourself. We'll be here whenever you have time. Keep being yourself. Can't thank you enough. Oh, Charles Snow, that's really that's really kind of you. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's very generous and very kind words that I will um that I will uh adhere to. Um yeah, don't worry. I'm I will uh I, I will take care to not overwork myself. But uh, but I do love doing these. I do love doing these. I like to do them when I when I can. All right. Thank you everybody. Have a great time. Remain unhaunted. Hang on, I should wave with the other hand, really, because it doesn't sort of poke off the edge of the green screen quite so much. Take it easy, folks. Always a pleasure. See you next time. Whoa, well, hang on, I meant to disappear there. Here we go. Whoosh. And I'm back. And I'm gone.